if you were stranded on a deserted island for the rest of your life, but were allowed to take five things with you to help you survive, what would you take? You can never get off the island, and there's no one coming to save you. Take a few moments. Maybe even write your five items down. I ask this question of my 6th grade students every year. Every year, without fail, they come up with some very interesting and a few realistic answers for their five items. Perhaps you understand the premise of the question. Perhaps you don't. If you answered like most of my students, you probably said things like a flashlight, matches, lighter, tent, gun, bow and arrow, rope, hatchet. They read that novel in 6th grade and many of them instantly think of that book when I ask this question. A fishing pole? Solar-powered lamp? The list goes on and on. The problem with most of those items is, what will you do when they break or run out? With the exception of a hatchet, which would be quite useful if you made sure it was a hatchet with the blade end and a hammer end, all those items require upkeep that you will not be able to provide at some point. Whether it's batteries, broken string, fraying, wear and tear, failed solar cells, all those items will fail, and you'll have no replacement. The reason I ask this, and subsequently break down the responses, isn't to display students' lack of survival skills. It's to show them how difficult survival, with basic means, even with advanced knowledge, would really be. Then, I read them this chapter from E.H. Gombrich's A Little History of the World. Chapter 2. The Greatest Inventors of All Time Near Heidelberg in Germany, somebody was once digging a pit when they came across a bone deep under the ground. It was a human bone, a jaw bone. But no human beings today have jaws like this one. It was so massive and strong and had such powerful teeth. Whoever owned it must have been able to bite really hard and must have lived a long time ago for the bone to be buried so deep. On another occasion, but still in Germany, in the Neander Valley, a human skull was found, and this was also immensely interesting because nobody alive today has a skull like this one either. Instead of a forehead like ours, it just had two thick ridges above the eyebrows. Now, if all our thinking goes on behind our foreheads, and these people didn't have any foreheads, then perhaps they didn't think as much as we do, or at any rate, thinking may have been harder for them. So the people who examined the skull concluded that once upon a time, there were people who weren't very good at thinking, but who were better at biting than we are today. But now you're going to say, stop. That's not what we agreed. When did these people live? What were they like and how did they live? Your questions make me blush, as I have to admit that we don't know precisely. But we will find out one day, and maybe you will want to help. We don't know because these people didn't yet know how to write things down. And memory only takes us a little way back. But we are making new discoveries all the time. Scientists have found that certain materials, such as wood and plants and volcanic rocks, change slowly, but regularly, over a very long period of time. This means that we can work out when they grew or were formed. And since the discoveries in Germany, people have carried on searching and digging, and have made some startling finds. In Asia and Africa in particular, more bones have been found, some at least as old as the Heidelberg jaw. These were our ancestors, who may have already been using stones as tools more than 150,000 years ago. They were different from the Neanderthal people, who appeared about 70,000 years earlier, and inhabited the earth for about 200,000 years. And I owe the Neanderthal people an apology, for despite their low foreheads, their brains were no smaller than those of most people today. But all these abouts, with no names and no dates, this isn't history, you say. And you are right. It comes before history. That is why we call it prehistory. Because we only have a rough idea of when it all happened. But we still know something about the people whom we call prehistoric. At the time when real history begins, and we will come to that in the next chapter, people already had all the things we have today. Clothes, houses, and tools. Plows to plow with. Grains to make bread with. Cows for milking. Sheep for shearing. Dogs for hunting and for company bows and arrows for shooting, and helmets and shields for protection. Yet with all these things, there must have been a first time. Someone must have made the discovery. Isn't it an amazing thought that one day a prehistoric man, or a woman, 
must have realized that meat from wild animals was easier to chew if it was first held over a fire and roasted, and that one day someone discovered how to make fire? Do you realize what that actually means? Can you do it? Not with matches, because that didn't exist, but by rubbing two sticks together until they become so hot that in the end they catch fire. Have a go, and then you'll see how hard it is. Tools must have been invented by someone too. The earliest ones were probably just sticks and stones, but soon stones were being shaped and sharpened. We have found lots of these shaped stones in the ground. And because of these stone tools, we call this time the Stone Age. But people didn't yet know how to build houses. Not a pleasant thought, since at that time, it was often intensely cold, at certain periods far colder than today. Winters were longer, summers shorter. Snow lay deep throughout the year, not only on the mountaintops, but down in the valleys as well, and glaciers, which were immense in those days, spread far out into the plains. This is why we say that the Stone Age began before the last Ice Age had ended. Prehistoric people must have suffered dreadfully from the cold, and if they came across a cave where they could shelter from the freezing winds, how happy they must have been. For this reason, they are also known as cavemen although they may not have actually lived in caves. Do you know what else these cavemen invented? Can you guess? They invented talking. I mean having real conversations with each other using words. Of course, animals also make noises. They can cry out when they feel pain and make warning calls when danger threatens. But they don't have names for things as human beings do, and prehistoric people were the first creatures to do so. They invented something else that was wonderful too. Pictures. Many of these can still be seen today, scratched and painted on the walls of caves. No painter alive now could do better. The animals they depict don't exist anymore. They were painted so long ago. Elephants with long, thick coats of hair and great curving tusks, woolly mammoths, and other Ice Age animals. Why do you think these prehistoric people painted animals on the walls of caves? Just for decoration? That doesn't seem likely, because the caves were so dark. Of course we can't be sure, but we think they may have been trying to make magic. That they believed that painting pictures of animals on the walls would make those animals appear. Rather like when we say, talk of the devil, when someone we've been talking about turns up unexpectedly. After all, these animals were their prey, and without them they would starve. So they may have been trying to invent a magic spell. It would be nice to think that such things worked, but they never have yet. The Ice Age lasted for an unimaginably long time, many tens of thousands of years, which was just as well for otherwise these people would not have had time to invent all these things. But gradually the earth grew warmer and the ice retreated to the high mountains, and people, who by now were much like us, learnt with the warmth to plant grasses, and then grind the seeds to make a paste which they could bake in the fire, and this was bread. In the course of time, they learned to build tents and tame animals, which until then had roamed freely around. And they followed their herds as people in Lapland still do. Because forests were dangerous places in those days, home to large numbers of wild animals such as wolves and bears, people in several places, and this is often the case with inventors, had the same excellent idea. They built pile dwellings in the middle of lakes, huts on stilts rammed deep in the mud. By this time, they were masters at shaping and polishing their tools, and used a different, harder stone to bore holes in their axe heads for handles. That must have been hard work. Work which could take the whole of winter. Imagine how often the axe head must have broken at the last minute, so that they had to start all over again. The next thing these people discovered was how to make pots out of clay, which they soon learned to decorate with patterns and fire in ovens. Although by this time in the late Stone Age, they had stopped painting pictures of animals. In the end, perhaps 6,000 years ago, that is 4,000 BC, they found a new and more convenient way of making tools. They discovered metals. Not all of them at once, of course. It began with some green stones which turned into copper when melted in a fire. Copper has a nice shine, and you can use it to make arrowheads and axes, but it is soft and gets blunt more quickly than stone. But once again, people found an answer. They discovered that if you add just a little of another rare metal, it makes the copper stronger. That metal is tin, and a mixture of tin and copper is called bronze. 
the age in which people made themselves helmets and swords, axes and cauldrons, bracelets and necklaces out of bronze, is naturally known as the Bronze Age. Now let's take a last look at these people dressed in skins, as they paddle their boats made of hollowed out tree trunks towards their villages of huts on stilts, bringing grain or perhaps salt from mines in the mountains. They drink from splendid pottery vessels, and their wives and daughters wear jewelry made of colored stones and even gold. Do you think much has changed since then? They were people, just like us, often unkind to one another, often cruel and deceitful. Sadly, so are we. But even then, a mother might sacrifice her life for her child, and friends might die for each other. No more, but also no less often than people do today. And how could it be otherwise? After all, we're only talking about things that happened between three and ten thousand years ago. There hasn't been enough time for us to change. So just once in a while, when we are talking or eating some bread, using tools or warming ourselves by the fire, we should remember those early people with gratitude, for they were the greatest inventors of all time. End of chapter 2 The development of the tools we would need to become who we are today must have been excruciatingly difficult and required an amount of perseverance that many people today simply aren't expected to undertake on a consistent basis anymore. Which of these inventions or innovations would even have been the most important? Language, or the ability to communicate, is probably high up there on that list, if not number one. While it may have been very low on the list in the hypothetical I threw at you to begin this episode, it changes drastically if we change the scenario slightly. You and 15 strangers, who all speak only a single different language from one another, are dropped on a deserted island. Add that to the beginning of the question, and it changes fundamentally. Now, priority number one might be something that can help you communicate, or help you learn to communicate. We're pack animals. We work best in groups and not on our own. Many introverts out there, myself included, may think each man is an island, but this simply isn't true, nor is it possible to maintain. In these groups, certain other details besides survival have to be hammered out to work. One is communication, and the other is the division of labor or jobs. In the earliest humans, this was hunting and gathering. The men hunted while the women and children gathered and tended to the camp. Few of the early Paleolithic people would have lived in caves. They certainly would have used them for shelter in storms or from predators, but their day-to-day -day lives more than likely revolved around their moving camp within their home territory. A hunter-gatherer tribe had a home territory. They wandered in search for food and prey. It was generally believed to be about two square miles in size. Anthropologically, there are some interesting conclusions you can draw about modern humans based off of evolution from the Paleolithic hunter-gatherers. One is about communication. It's conceivable that women are better communicators than men, generally speaking, and more empathetic, again, generally speaking, because their role early on was to gather food, raise children, and take care of the camp. This required empathy and communication. Men, on the other hand, were expected to hunt, meaning a talkative or overly empathetic man to the plight of animals or his other hunters wouldn't catch anything. This, early on in human history, when the numbers of humans only numbered in their thousands, not even millions, or today's billions, means that a critical flaw for survival would be taken out of the gene pool evolutionarily quickly due to the deadly nature of early human life. Again, remember back to the question we started with, and our amended question, and follow that through logically. Piece by piece, scenario by scenario, that is a precarious situation that can turn from bad to worse to you being dead very quickly. Death would have been just around the corner for our Paleolithic ancestors. Most children would have died before becoming adults. I've seen estimates as high as 70% of Paleolithic humans died as children, and life expectancy figures as bleak as 22 years old. Between constant danger of starvation, a hard life, no medicine to speak of, and animal predators, it's no wonder Paleolithic humans lived in small groups that never grew past 60 or so humans. Paleolithic people lived in a world that must have been downright frightening most of the time, one that we can scarcely begin to imagine, which is a great explanation for why modern humans have such great fight-or-flight responses. So these, Paleolith so these Paleolithic people, the Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons, last for thousands of years, 
And while the Neanderthals die out as a species, the Cro-Magnons become us. In these thousands of years, the Paleolithic people laid the foundation for our modern society, learning some of the greatest skills and making some of the most important tools we'll ever have. Language, fire, sharpened edges, hammers, domesticated dogs to help us with hunting. Most importantly, though, was something a woman discovered. Agriculture is the science or practice of farming, including cultivation of the soil for the growing of crops and the rearing of animals to provide food, wool, and other products. Planting seeds to farm was most likely the result of a woman observing plants and how they grew. One theory is that she may have observed that excess seed thrown out in their trash took root and grew, and that could have provided the spark for the beginning of farming. Unfortunately, we can't know for sure due to lack of written records, but it's most likely that a woman, not a man, would have had the time and exposure to the plants necessary to make the observations. It follows through logically. This is a huge step forward in the human story. With farming, you could grow more food than you could eat, providing an excess or surplus of food that the other members of the community could eat, freeing them up for other tasks. According to the articles, Statue of Early Europeans, and The Origins of Sex Differences in Early Human Beings, quote, It has long been taken for granted that the introduction of agriculture has been an unequivocal progress. This is now questioned in view of findings by archaeologists and paleopathologists showing that nutritional standards of Neolithic populations were generally inferior to that of hunter-gatherers, and that their life expectancy may well have been shorter too, in part due to disease and harder work. Hunter-gatherers must have covered their food needs with about 20 hours of work, while agriculture required much more and was at least as uncertain. The hunter-gatherer's diet was more varied and balanced than what agriculture allowed. Average height went down from 5 feet 10 inches for men and 5 feet 6 inches for women to 5 feet 5 inches and 5 feet 1 inches respectively, and it took until the 20th century for average human height to come back to the pre-Neolithic revolution levels. Agriculturalists had more anemias and vitamin deficiencies, more spinal deformations, more dental pathologies. However, the decrease in individual nutrition was accompanied by an increase in population. The traditional view is that agricultural food production supported a denser population, which in turn supported larger sedentary communities. The accumulation of goods and tools and specialization in diverse forms of new labor, the development of larger societies, led to the development of different means of decision-making and to governmental organization. Food surpluses made possible the development of a social elite who were not otherwise engaged in agriculture, industry, or commerce, but dominated their communities by other means and monopolized decision-making. End quote. While the production of food created a surplus of food, it also created a more complex social structure. I often pose this question to my students when we begin the Neolithic age in class. If you didn't have to go to school, what would you do with that free time? As an adult, think of it this way. If you didn't have to work, what would you use that free time for? Almost all of the students respond with various leisure activities, as I assume those of you listening probably did too. Something hobby-related. Read, binge-watch Netflix, spend all day eating chips on the couch watching YouTube, playing your favorite sports, playing video games, etc. Very few students, or adults for that matter, answer this question with, I would go to school so I could get a good job, or I would start a business. The point of the question is twofold. First, it points out to students that the reason they use their free time to go to school is to get a job, to make money, to buy food and survive. Specialization, or the development of skills and occupations outside food production, is the result of people finding a way to make a living doing something that will allow them to acquire food without producing it themselves. We are still the same people who invented all this 10,000 plus years ago. And our society, like theirs, is organized with a single purpose, acquiring enough food to eat so you don't starve. Secondly, this question shows the students that the drive to produce something of meaning to the society as a whole, or the drive to better themselves, is a rare trait. Most people need to be pushed 
or driven by something to be productive or motivated to learn new skills. The expansion of the population due to agriculture and the ability to have specialized occupations not focused on food production required society to become more organized. And so we moved from tribes run by patriarchs, or perhaps even matriarchs, to the village where we see the rise of the leader, or chieftain. An interesting side note, we don't have any evidence of there ever being a female chieftain from this time period. The basic reasons behind the organization of society via governmental and religious structures is to control the population to do what's necessary for survival. If you think it through logically, it's easy to see why. If, as a teacher, I give a class a task, and then unexpectedly leave the room, a few things will happen. Initially, the students will continue to do the assigned task. After about five minutes, a few of the students will begin to talk and work more slowly. After 10 minutes, most of the class is now conversing and work has slowed significantly. After 30 minutes, a select few students will have finished the task and be reading or working on work for another class. But the majority of the class, perhaps 26 or 27 of the 30 students, will have failed to complete the task and moved on to activities that better neither themselves nor their grades. I may come back to find a few, perhaps two or three, involved in activities that would be explicitly breaking the rules. This simple scenario represents society on a wider scale when it's left to its own devices, and those two to three rule breakers represent those that don't buy into the system, or as we might say today, the criminal element. The structures of society are put in place to encourage people to conform to what that society deems is necessary for its survival. The earliest human agricultural societies are no different. The ability to slack off in these early civilizations simply didn't exist. In his book, History of the Persian Empire, A.T. Olmsted does an excellent job of painting a picture of life as a prehistoric human in the Iranian plateau. Quote, At first view, it is a pleasant world in which we meet the house master, richly endowed with cattle, fodder, hound, wife, child, fire, milk, and all good things with grain, grass, and trees bearing every variety of fruit. Waste lands were irrigated by the underground kanat, and there was increase of flocks and herds and plenty of natural fertilizer. But to obtain these blessings, hard work was demanded, sowing and planting, and laborious construction of the underground water channels. It was a world in which there was no place for the slothful. We hear of skins in use for clothing, or of woven cloth, of tents made of felt such as those yet found in Central Asia, and of houses of wood like those which have left the ash mounds of the Aramean plain. We might rhapsodize over the high position of the dog, elsewhere in the Orient, degraded and unclean, but on the plateau, treated as an honored member of the family, with definite responsibilities and corresponding rewards. We might prepare to rejoice with the peasants, when the long snowbound winter was over, and the birds began to fly, the plants to spring up, the torrents to flow down the hills, and the winds to dry the earth. But we should completely misunderstand their mood. End quote. While the human beings of the prehistoric periods of the Paleolithic and Neolithic Ages may never have discovered writing, they created the foundations of everything in our modern world. We owe a certain debt to those first humans who ventured out of Africa and on to the adventure of invention and innovation that gave us all we use still to this day to go about our daily lives in pursuit of acquiring food and shelter. I hope you enjoyed this episode of A Brief History of the World, brought to you by History in Context. Stay tuned for more episodes.